All right, so the next speaker is uh, going to be uh, uh, Rick Birch, uh, also known as Thales sometimes. And uh, he's going to talk about uh, general characterization of particle detector models. Thales, whenever you want, the floor is yours. Thanks for the introduction, Adrian. Uh, can you hear me well? All right, so uh, yeah, today I'm gonna talk about this uh, paper that I put out uh, recently this year. It's uh, called uh, a general characterization of particle detector models because the goal of this paper was essentially to be able to formulate a uh, formulation of particle detectors that would work in curved spacetimes and that could couple to any field operator from any quantum field theory. So the first step in order to get to this general characterization will be to talk about uh, localized non-relativistic quantum systems in curved spacetimes because the detector is simply this, but now coupling with a quantum theory. So uh, the first step then will be to present this formulas for describing this non-relativistic quantum system. In this case here, it's gonna be a system described by a position degree of freedom. So simply a, a wave function uh, that's localized around the projector. So essentially this means that there's a potential that traps this particle that localizes it in space around the given trajectory that it's following. And we want to do this in a background curve space then. So essentially this means that we need to take into account the, the curvature space then. And the way that we're going to take this into account will be essentially by using the Fermi normal coordinates. And without further ado, let's simply briefly review the Fermi normal coordinates so that we can describe this this part. So the Fermi normal coordinates around the uh, trajectory Z of tau are essentially a coordinate system such that if an event has coordinates tau and X, this essentially means that this event lies in the rest surface, sigma tau, where sigma tau is this rest surface associated with the trajectory labeled by this parameter tau, which is the first coordinate of the Fermi normal coordinates. This parameter tau also happens to be the proper time of the trajectory, so, so that we use the proper time of the trajectory to label these rest surfaces. And the, the position of the space-like part of the Fermi normal coordinates determine the direction and the proper distance from this event to the curve within eight slice. So this essentially, these are the properties that we're gonna use of the Fermi normal coordinates. And something very important to be mentioned is the fact that these coordinates are only locally defined around the trajectory. So acceleration of the curve and curvature spacetime might actually uh, prevent these trajectories from being globally defined. So uh, using this, now the next step is essentially to estimate the, the maximum size that a system can have so that it can be described in Fermi normal coordinates. So this Fermi bound is essentially exactly this. It's the maximum radius that a system can have. So the Fermi normal coordinates is enough to completely describe the system. And this is what we're going to use later to define our quantum formula. Now we can estimate this, the, this radius essentially in terms of the acceleration of spacetime and the curvature of, of spacetime essentially, or the negative eigenvalues of the induced curvature in the surface. And this estimate here will be useful for us to establish a regime of validity for this description of localized non-relativistic quantum systems and also later for particle detector models. So now that we have this about the, the Fermi normal coordinates, our goal will be to describe wave functions that are localized in curved space -tons. So in order to provide this formalism, first let's consider simply a non-relativistic particle with a position group freedom. So essentially a wave function that lives in this square, space of square integral functions with a position and momentum operators, and such that its dynamics are prescribed by this Hamiltonian H, which is a function of both the position and momentum operators, but also possibly of an external time parameter T. Now, our goal here is to find a way of embedding this theory in curved spacetimes around the trajectory. So what we want to do is instead of having the wave functions defined in the space of their square integral functions, we want to define them in the space of square integral functions in each space slice. After doing this, we're going to have to find a way of generalizing the position and momentum operators to curved space -tons. And then we're going to have to find what are the changes in the dynamics that happen when we perform this, this transition to curved space -tons, when we put the particle localized around the trajectory. So the very first step is to define an inner product. The inner product that will be used with the wave functions and operators is essentially the, the inner product with, which is the integral with respect to the measure of these uh, rest spaces. So essentially this T sigma. And simply by looking at the inner product or the definition of the wave function, we can already see a restriction that we must impose so that we can use this formalism. 
which is that the wave functions must be Fermi localized, that is localized within the, this Fermi bound radius. So within this region where we can use the Fermi normal coordinates in order to describe the system. We can relax this a little bit uh, by, by assuming that they, that, is, uh, that they are approximately Fermi localized, but uh, there are consequences to this. I do discuss them in the paper. So if you want to uh, take a look at it, but uh, for now, we're going to assume that the particle is Fermi localized. So the next step is to define a position operator. So the components of the position operator will act in the wave function simply by multiplication by the Fermi normal coordinates. And we pick this because the Fermi, Fermi normal coordinates have this physical meaning associated to distance and also to, to direction in, in each one of the, the coordinates. So it makes sense to define a position operator, which is analogous to how the position operator acts in flat space. And the next step is to define a momentum operator which essentially acts as differentiation, but we need to take into consideration the fact that the spacetime is also curved. And if we define this X and this P operators, what happens is they're both self-adjoint with respect to the inner product defined in the surfaces, and also they satisfy the canonical commutation relations. So this essentially defined the, the kinematics of the, the theory. Now, the next step is to define the dynamics, right? So we used to have the semitonian, which used to be a function of X and P, and possibly this external time parameter t. Now, in this case, what we do is simply that we reinterpret the x and p operators according to the previous definitions that I just gave. And also we, we replace this external time parameter by the proper time of the curve, which is where we are prescribing the, the, the dynamics. So if we do this, we obtain this new Hamiltonian, which is a function of the new x, p, and now the proper time of the curve. However, we also need to take something else into account, which is the redshift. So each one of the surfaces may evolve differently through space time. In order to take this into consideration, essentially we need to multiply the Hamiltonian by this redshift factor, okay? And so we do this. So this curly H is essentially the redshift factor times this adapted Hamiltonian. Now, when we have this, we are ready to write down Schrodinger's equations. There, there are some details here about the self-adjointness of this, this Hamiltonian. I'm not going to have much time to go into these details, but if you want to take a look, again, uh, check the paper. But, uh, but essentially what matters for us here is that if we assume that the non-relativistic energy of the system is much smaller than its rest mass, then we can approximate the, the, this redshift factor such that the final Hamiltonian that we obtain is the Hamiltonian that we had from before with the adaptations of X, P, and proper time, plus these two corrections here, which are a function of the acceleration of the curve and of the curvature space time. So uh, we're just going to label these uh, H rel for relativistic correction Hamilton. Now we put these two together and then we find that uh, the corrections due to the acceleration of the trajectory and curvature space time is, are all associated to these, uh, this relativistic Hamilton. So essentially this gives us a formulation that can be used for describing the, a localized non-relativistic quantum system. The two important conditions that the system has to satisfy in order for this framework to be employed are that one, the system has to be more localized than the Fermi bound, the trajectory, which we can estimate. So essentially if the system is more localized than this quantity in the right, essentially we can employ this formula. And the other uh, assumption that we need is that the non-relativistic energy of the system is sufficiently smaller than its rest energy so that we can approximate the Hamiltonian and this matches previous descriptions that are found in the literature. So again, if you want to see more details about this, uh, check the paper. But now the, the idea is that we will uh, use this in order to build a general notion of particle detector models. So a particle detector is essentially this localized non-relativistic quantum system but now it interacts with a quantum field as well. So this localized non-relativistic quantum system, this is exactly what we just described, right? So essentially the limits of validity and everything else also carry on for these particle detectors. Now, the other thing that we need to prescribe is how this detector interacts with a quantum field. So for us here, quantum field theory for a field uh, phi A, here A is gonna be any collection of Lorentz indices, is essentially an association of test fields with elements of a star algebra. This is essentially the AQFT formulation, right? And this is to say that essentially the field can be seen as this operator value distribution that acts in test functions via integration, if you will. And then you can impose conditions regarding causality and commutation relations of this, uh, and essentially you build your quantum field theory out of this, 
Now, having the quantum field theory, our goal is to couple a localized non-relativistic quantum system to a given operator in this theory. So uh, we have this operator OB here that we want to couple to. So it's essentially, this is this B is, again, any collection of Lorentz indices. Could be the derivative of a field, could be a vector field, could be a scalar, it doesn't really matter. And then what we want to have in the detector space is a tensor value operator, mu of tau, which is essentially a generalized monopole moment, okay? And it, with the same rank as the operator that we want to couple to. And then this ED here is simply an orthonormal frame so that we can express this tensor value operator. And then we can prescribe a, a scalar interaction Hamiltonian as follows. So we simply use the contraction here of the tensor value monopole moment with the op field operator OB. And on the other hand, we also have to consider the redshift factor that we have, right? So the redshift factor is not only present in the detector of free Hamiltonian, but also in the interaction with the quantum field, which is prescribed in the detector's frame. What's good about this model is that it can recover most usual models that we find in the literature. So how do we do this? So assume for a second that the monopole moment, this generalized monopole moment, is only a function of the position operator, and assume that the Hamiltonian for the detector, the full Hamiltonian of the detector, is time independent. Then in this case, we can expand the interaction Hamiltonian from before in the position base. And when we do this, essentially, the, we, we can factor here the square root of the determinant of the metric, the covariant measure of integration, because it's simply given by the, the product of the redshift factor with the measure in the surfaces. But this is quite not what we see usually in particle detectors. In order to get there, what we need to do is to uh, assume that we have discrete eigenfunctions with associated energy levels for the free Hamiltonian of the detector. And then in that case, we can expand the Hamiltonian from before in terms of this basis of eigenfunctions. And this starts to look more familiar, right? We have here the, um, the gap, the e to the i omega tau, very characteristic from particle detectors. This is the gap, the difference between energy levels. And here we have a contraction between a space time smearing tensor and the operator that we're coupled to, right? So in the end, this, this uh, space time smearing tensor is given by the product of the wave functions with this uh, generalized monopole tensor field, right? So essentially, this model here, if you use this, you can recover many particle detector models in the literature. The real scalar UDW, a complex scalar UDW, the light matter interaction, fermionic particle detectors, quadratically coupled models. You can even recover the model that the Boris just presented where the detector couples to linearize quantum gravity. So you name it, it can recover any of these, right? And what's nice about this formalism is that, uh, so it's the last slide, so yeah. Uh, so what's the, the, the best thing about this is that now we can actually find both the regime of validity of this, of these models, and find the consequences of the acceleration and curvature dynamics that happen to this detector. So remember that the Hamiltonian of the detector is given by the original Hamiltonian essentially, plus these relativistic corrections, which are a function of acceleration and curvature. And we need to take these into consideration when we're probing a quantum field. The way that we do this, well, there are two cases. Uh, the first case is if the total Hamiltonian is time independent. So if these acceleration curvature dynamics are independent of time, then in this case, we can just, just compute the new gap and, and the new wave functions of the detector. And these will depend on curvature and acceleration. So this is how these change the dynamics of the detector. And the other case is if this Hamiltonian is time dependent. In this case, we can't apply perturbation theory to the full to two just the interaction with the field. We also need to apply perturbation theory with the interaction Hamiltonian that is associated with the relativistic correction. So the interaction Hamiltonian would become the sum of these two, uh, of both the field and the relativistic corrections. So essentially, the relativistic corrections essentially will blur the effect of the quantum field. If we want to use particle detector models to detect a quantum field, we have to take this into consideration. So sorry that I went a little bit over time. Uh, essentially the conclusions are uh, here. We developed this framework. We identified the new dynamics. Uh, we found the two conditions essentially, which are that the framework is valid if the system is more localized than the Fermi bound and it's non-relativistic energy is sufficiently smaller than the rest mass. And then we applied this to particle detector models. So thank you very much for the attention. And uh, here is the, sorry about that. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. I thought it was quite an interesting talk.
but I I was wondering, you, know, you zoom through, you say you recover all these kinds of detectors. What I'm wondering is if there is, like you say it's only good for, you know, when the Hamiltonian energies are much smaller than the rest mass. But what I'm wondering is if that formalism could recover what has been done in situations of high symmetry. Like if you've got just spherical symmetry and the space-like slices are, are spheres, if you can recover some of the kinds of things that were done for, uh, well, what we did with black holes, for example, or maybe what was done earlier in cosmological settings when you have full homogeneity and so on. Have you thought about that? So I, I, I haven't, but what I can say about this, this formalism itself is that, so the idea here is to describe small systems, right? Small systems that are non-relativistic in this background curve space then, right? So uh, in this sense, if, if you, because the idea is to assign one quantum degree of freedom to the whole detector, right? Uh, uh, in the paper, I actually have a more general formulation where you can add more internal uh, degrees of freedom, things like this. But overall, you need this one wave function, right? So this formula is clearly will not work for describing, for instance, a uh, wave function in a whole spherical shell, because that is too big to be described by a single wave function. I think that will describe one particle, say, or, or that would have only one position degree of freedom, I would say. And also, at that stage, the curvature space time, all of the relativistic effects that are long distance would also start uh, taking place, right? But now, if you want to apply this formula in order to, say, describe a, an atom around a black hole or something like this, that would work without any issues, right? So that's what I can say about it. Okay, well, I, I was just thinking, like, you've got R, 0, I, 0, J coupled to the Xs, right? And yeah. I, I guess I was thinking that if the curvature, for example, is constant, then it will sort of factor out of the problem and you should be able to push it a lot farther. That's I, I actually have a, an example that I did in the paper. I, I actually have slides about this. I can show you really quick. It's very, um, so this is the example that I consider. Essentially I consider a curvature, a, a constant curvature space then and a harmonic oscillator there, right? So if you do this uniform accelerator harmonic oscillator, if you do this in the end, what you find is that the, Essentially, you get a change in the frequency. This alpha here is the inverse of the curvature radius uh, squared. And you find that the wave functions also shift by a given amount. So this will always work in the case where you have a constant acceleration or constant curvature. You can always, at least with a harmonic oscillator, you can incorporate these into the description of the detector itself. And then it's the case one that I mentioned before. So now I, I went kind of quickly through this because it was in the end of my time. But in this case, one here, when the full Hamiltonian of the detector with the relativistic corrections is time independent, then you can just simply compute the new gap and the new wave functions, which will now be a function of the acceleration and curvature. And that is the, and that will define your new detector, right? Okay, thank you. That's helpful. That That's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I have this example done explicitly on the paper if you want to check it out. So, yeah. yeah.